Good morning, church. If you have your Bible, I'll ask you to turn to the book of James. The book of James will go to chapter 2, and I will read for you verses 1 through 13. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, will you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor men. Are not the rich ones those who oppress you and the ones who drag you to court? Are they not the ones that, who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfilled the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Forever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father, I pray that our time in your word would be profitable for all who have come this morning. I pray, Lord, you know the weakness of this vessel. You know the weakness of my body, of my mind, of my emotions. And so we definitely need the arrival of your Holy Spirit, both in me and those who are listening. And I pray by your grace and mercy that you would fulfill the promise you have made in Scripture to make us more like Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about 10 miles. We live in an age where you can get on a website or turn on your TV and you can see news from anywhere in the world. And your attention can be drawn in the same half an hour to Florida, to Israel, to Russia, to China, to Idaho. But I want to talk to you this morning about 10 miles. I want you to think in your mind about a circle. And in the middle of that circle is this church. And I want that circle to be a 10-mile radius around this church. And with just a little bit of research, we can know a few things. We can know within that 10 miles is someone who has recently lost a job. Within that 10 miles, we'll find an alcoholic, a teen mom. We will find a child whose parents are divorced, a girl who's being abused, and a child who has never heard of Jesus. You will find people who are recently mourning a loss. You will find people dealing with enormous amounts of physical pain. And in those 10 miles, you will, in, you will encounter people who are never, were not born in this country. Of course, within those 10 miles, you will find people in this church, right? You will find people in this church who are grieving, who are parenting, who are married, and you will find people who have coworkers who drive them crazy. Now, if you wanted a definition of ministering to another person, the Bible gives us to it, gives a, a definition to us, and the definition of ministry is the bearing of a burden. Now, sometimes to bear a burden is very, very easy. Somebody comes to you and says, I need $10 to put gas in my car. That's a pretty easy burden for most of us. But sometimes those burdens are very, very heavy. In that, uh, for example, a, an opportunity to go and, and sit with somebody who is grieving a loss. But ministry really is about bearing a burden. And this morning in our text, James is going to deal with a particular sin 
that stops us from ministry. It stops us from bearing burdens. Now, our text this morning is pretty simple. James is addressing the issue of partiality or favoritism. And he even gives us an illustration of what he's talking about. He tells us about two men who walk into a church service. Now, likely, this church service it would have been in someone's home. But two men walk in. First, we have a man who's got a gold ring. He's wearing very nice clothes. And he is told to sit in this very prominent, invisible place because he is rich. And a poor man comes in and he is told to sit out of the way and on the floor because he is poor. You see the decision to put the rich man where they do because he's rich and the poor man where they do because he's poor. James is saying that is your example of the sin of partiality. And so the message really is simple. Don't show partiality. As a Christian, that is a calling for you in every situation, every, every place in life, every person you meet. You are commanded, do not show partiality. This morning, I'm going to give you, I'm going to highlight the three reasons James is going to give us as to why we are to not show partiality. So, three points for you this morning as to why we should not show partiality. Number one, partiality is a sign of wrong judgment. You see in verse 4, James says, If you show partiality, you have made distinction among yourselves using evil thoughts. Now, when we think of evil thoughts, we probably think of those who are thinking about committing murder or those who are thinking about embezzling money from a company. But I, the idea behind this phrase, evil thoughts, is really the idea of you treating someone on the basis of something you should not be using as the basis of treatment. So you have decided to treat someone a certain way based on a judgment that you have used that you should not be using. That is the idea of that phrase, evil thoughts. But I want to explain this a little further. It is not partiality to honor someone who has years of faithfulness. The Bible commands us to do that, and so therefore it is a right judgment to use. It is not partiality to show preference to your spouse over other people. That is commanded for us to do, and so therefore it is a right judgment it is not partiality to practice church discipline and to remove a member because of an active, public, sinful lifestyle. Again, it's a right judgment that God calls us to use. So James is not saying that we're supposed to treat everyone the same. My wife would get very mad if I treated every woman around me just like her. We can't and we shouldn't do that. What James is saying is that if we use something other than what God has said, we are showing partiality, and that is sin. We are using wrong judgment. Now, we can go through our New Testament, we can find a number of examples of partiality. For example, in the book of Galatians, Paul makes it very, very clear that using someone's ethnic origin to, uh, to decide how you are going to treat them is wrong judgment. It is partiality. It is sin. He also, in Galatians, will use the idea of, a, of someone's economic condition as wrong judgment. He will even use the idea of gender being the idea of wrong judgment. The phrase evil thoughts, though, also means that when someone uses partiality, which God forbids, when, God, when someone uses a judgment that God has said not to use, they are in fact supposed to be questioned in other areas. So, for example, if you see somebody or know somebody who shows partiality due to economic condition, 
You should question any advice they give you about your marriage. You should question any advice they give you about raising kids. If they show partiality, if they use wrong judgment or use uh, a judgment God has said not to use when it comes to the basis of how they treat someone, you should question their judgment everywhere. That is the idea. Now, if you have done that, if you realize this morning, Pastor Tim, I know that I have used economics or gender or ethnicity as the basis for why I treated someone that way, I would encourage you then to begin to question your thoughts in other places. You see, this text is about more than just being nice to poor people. Partiality is the kind of sin that reveals other sins. Someone who uses partiality as the basis for why they treat people a certain way is someone whose judgment is compromised. And we need to be honest. This is in every one of our hearts. Now, of course, there are generations who have partiality in some way or another. There have been generations, of course, who have been plagued by using ethnic bias for their, uh, their partiality. Other have grown up. I've met lots of people who have used gender for partiality. Now, I, for one, am very thankful that fellowship does not hire based on looks or I would still be unemployed. <laughs> but all of us have used evil thoughts to judge another human being. So let me give you a practical application. Twice in my time in ministry, so 15, 16 years, I have found myself serving at a church where there was someone with significant developmental delays. In one church, it was a young man in his early 20s who was very overweight, who did not take care of himself, and so often he did not smell good. If you tried to have a conversation, he would speak very loudly. Years later, I was in another church and I found a, or there was a young woman almost in the same condition. She was well overweight. She did not wash regularly. She talked very loudly and would get up and go in and out of the service many times. Now, one church where the young man was, I watched as people avoided him. Now, there were one or two who would try to befriend him and try to saddle up next to him and, and, and encourage him in the things of the Lord. But one or two is not a good number in a church of 350. In the other church with the young lady, I watched as this church took care of her. They went to her home and, and fixed things up. They would clean her house on a regular basis. They showed a great deal of kindness to her. And so the question for us is who would we be? What judgment would we use? What would James say about the way you respond when you encounter various people in your life? The second reason this morning as to why James says that we should not show partiality is number two, partiality denies the gospel. Partiality denies the gospel. I want you to go all the way back to verse 1. James is making it very clear. He is talking to Christians, and he is talking about Christianity, and he describes the Christian faith as faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and then there's this description, the Lord of glory. Now this phrase, Lord of glory, might be a little bit different. If you're using a, a, a different translation, we use the ESV. If you're using a different translation, that might read a little differently. And the reason for that is because what James says here is very difficult to translate into English. But the idea is clear. Jesus Christ is a person who has more glory than anybody else. He is the Lord of glory. Now, what is glory? Glory. We talk about that word a lot. What is glory? Well, 
glory is what draws your attention. For example, the Bible tells us that the glory of a woman is her hair. It draws attention. If you go to a museum and you see a golden coffin of a pharaoh and you go, wow, that's really cool, you are drawn in by its glory. Now there's a reason attractive people find themselves in TVs and movies on the cover of books. Why? Because it draws your attention. They have glory. What James is saying here is that Jesus has the most glory. So if you were to put a, a rich, handsome, powerful man next to Jesus, Jesus' glory would be more. If you put them side by side, it is Jesus to whom your attention would go. With that said, look at verses 5 through 7. James gives us a general statement. For the most part, people who become Christians are poor, and people who persecute Christians are rich. The focus should be on this phrase, has not God chosen the poor to be rich with faith and the heirs of kingdom? You see, he's pointing out their wrong judgment. He's saying, in fact, God saves people who bring nothing to the table. Or if you want to put it this way, the, the big idea that James is pushing here is that our Savior, the Lord of glory, has brought salvation to people who have no glory. That's the gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Or if you think of it this way, if you were to get on an AI generator and you asked it, what does a Christian historically look like? If it's, if it's accurate, it should show somebody with darker skin, calloused hands, raggedy clothes, and poor health. That is who we've been for the vast majority of church history. But let me be clear. So he's not saying that poor people are saved because they're poor. The gospel is the only way to be saved. God has provided that salvation. And he, the Lord of glory, has made it or provided salvation so that even the poorest can be saved. So any Christian church, any Christian individual who shows partiality should be embarrassed because they have denied with their actions what they confess with their mouth. The Christian story is this. We were poor and unable to save ourselves. God did all the work to save us and continues to do all the work to keep us saved. As one great preacher said it, the only thing we, we bring to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. Do you know names? Do you know names like Amy Carmichael, who ministered to the poor? Or Lemuel Hayes, who ministered to the neglected, or C.T. Studd, who gave up riches and fame to die spreading the gospel. Each of their lives tells the Christian story. Now, one of my favorites is about a preacher by the name of Henry Garricky. Henry Garricky was around my age when World War II started. He was a pastor, wanted to go and help. So he signed up, went through everything. He's always a, a chaplain, goes through the war and comes to the end of the war. And he gets a really interesting assignment, or in fact, probably a horrific assignment. He gets to be the chaplain at the trials at Nuremberg. His ministry was to six or seven high-ranking Nazi officers. Now, how many of us would not have blamed him if he found them unworthy to hear the gospel? But he didn't. He would daily go to each of their cells, trying and giving an opportunity for them to hear the gospel. See, that's the Christian story. 
much as we don't want to believe it, the gospel is even for the glory of the gospel is even for men who did some of the greatest evil this world had ever seen. Now the application here is this, what story does your life tell? Now the Bible gives us some help in this. Tells us how we can tell the gospel story with our lives. For example, the gospel story is seen when we open our homes and feed our guests. We tell the gospel story when we forgive debts. We tell the gospel story when we forgive sins against us. We tell the gospel story with the acts of generosity. And we tell the gospel show, story when we show no partiality. When we live knowing that the Lord of glory has saved us. And that means someone with no glory can have salvation too. So again, what does the story of your life tell? And then number three, the third reason we're told not to show partiality is this. Partiality leaves no room for mercy. Partiality leaves no room for mercy. I want you to see down in verse 8, James reminds us of a very simple truth. Love your neighbor as yourself. He tells the reader, if you're doing this, you're doing really well. But partiality breaks this command. Once again, we have to grab the fact that James is talking to people who care about following Jesus. This is not the same situation as 1 Corinthians and Paul rebuking the Corinthians for being carnal and fleshly. This is not Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews rebukes him for not being faithful. These are people who are earnestly trying to follow Jesus. The reality is they have a blind spot. That's the point James is making in verses 10 and 11. It's very possible to be doing the right thing in many areas of your life. You don't steal. You don't cheat on your wife. Perhaps you serve as a Sunday school teacher. You help clean up after events at church. But at the same time, there are things in your life God has to work on. Let me explain it this way. So years ago, I, I got a chance to sit down with an older gentleman. He had served in World War II. He had been married to the same woman for 50 plus years. He had faithfully served in the church and he was generally one of those guys who would always be called the pillar of the community. But one of the things he, would say, he said to me that I will always remember is he said, when it comes to the Christian faith, there are no such things as priorities. What he was trying to tell me is that if I'm a good dad, it doesn't excuse me from being a bad pastor. He said bad pastoring is not an excuse even if you're a good dad. He's trying to say if I go and, and work at a soup kitchen and then later on that evening slander my neighbor, I've still done something wrong. God calls me to be faithful in all areas of, at all times and in every place. Now that's a big and difficult calling, isn't it? Isn't it? Which is why we need verses 12 and 13. To understand that we live under the law of liberty and the law of liberty is full of mercy. The idea here is one of getting mercy and showing mercy. James is saying it is better to show mercy than to worry about the consequences of mercy. To give you an example, he's saying it is better for you to give $10 to the homeless man than be worried about whether or not he's going to use it on booze. You see, because through Christ we have been shown great mercy instead of judgment. And we are to do the same. We received mercy, let us show mercy. You see, partiality or choosing who gets mercy and who does not is actually not mercy at all. So, can you admit in your life that there are areas in your life 
in your Christian walk where you come up short? I hope so. Because even the Apostle Paul said he had not arrived. But do you look at your Christian life and think because you do well in some areas that you can break God's command in another area and that's okay? Now we all do that in some way, but remember there is mercy, not judgment, waiting for you at the feet of Jesus. And so the challenge of James is this. Because of that mercy that's always waiting for you, where are you going to show mercy? Let's come back to that 10 miles. I know your life is busy. And I know your life has challenges. And you live in that busyness and you live with those challenges being met again and again with mercy from your Heavenly Father. So where in those 10 miles are you going to pass that mercy along? Now up on the screen, you're going to see a list. There are great and wonderful causes that we as a church partner with, and so many of you have been very faithful to support. In fact, you see them, and you would do well to volunteer and donate to any of them. In a few weeks, we're going to have fill the trailer. But this morning, I want you to think of something personal. If you have a day job, if you go to the grocery store, if you ever stop by and talk to a neighbor, if you've ever called someone or texted somebody, this applies to you. In the course of your daily life, more often than not, you will hear about someone or something or a situation. The next time it happens, I want you to ask the question, how can I show off mercy that I've received? Let me give you an example of what I mean. Say you hear of a house fire. And you say, you know what, I can show mercy in that moment by providing clothes. That's a great idea. But let me challenge you to take one more step. What kind of step could you take in that moment? So you've got a good idea. There's been a fire. I can donate clothes. But what's another step you can go? How can you show just a little more mercy? What if instead of donating, you bought new clothes? Or maybe even push it further. What if you went out and bought clothes that are better than the ones you have at home? So God's word is very clear. We have been shown mercy. We are to show mercy in good and tangible ways. And the sin of partiality can keep us from fulfilling that calling. Partiality means we are using wrong judgment. We are using the wrong way to weigh and measure the things of life. Showing partiality denies the gospel as the Lord of glory has made a salvation that is even for the poorest of people in every way. Showing partiality leaves no room for mercy. And we have been called and we have been shown mercy by Jesus. And so we are called to pass that mercy along without partiality. Let's pray. Father, these are a simple thing, but the reality of our hearts is that these are hard to do. Lord, partiality comes so easily to us using those wrong judgments. Father, we are often inconsistent and hypocritical. But let us remind ourselves that we, we meet mercy at your feet. So let us, Father, meet the challenge of showing mercy to others in good and wonderful ways.